cold. A bone-breaking, breathtaking, bitter cold. It's the only environment that you've ever known. Living on the planet Proxy during the end of the 27th century, all you know is that bitter cold. You hear your father's father tell tales that his father's father told him about a home that you'll never know. A planet of civilization, with lush forests, vast deserts, bustling cities, and long white sand beaches under a warm D-type star that its inhabitants used to call the sun. A paradise, that's what you think, and you'll never get to see it with your own eyes. The people of that planet, isolated from your own by light years, cut off contact by distance and political strife, you will never see an earthling and never visit the paradise that is Earth. Until one day, after a hundred years of your people being on their own to fend for themselves in the wastelands of the worlds of the unforgiving star system Alpha Centauri, they, the people of Earth, show up on your doorstep. This is History of the Future, my own original series where we explore outer space through the lens of concept art and world building. Watch along as I create a living, breathing sci-fi universe based on the stars and exoplanets that we know to actually exist. Today, our subject is the Alpha Centauri system and its planets. In real life, we know quite a bit about the closest star system uh, to us beyond our sun. It's a trinary star system with the stars Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. The first two being sun-like in size, and Proxima Centauri being a red dwarf and flare star that puts out high amounts of radiation. We know of four planets in this star system. Orbiting Proxima Centauri, the smallest star, there are three relatively Earth-sized terrestrial planets at 0.02 AU, 0.04 AU, and 1.5 AU. For those of you who don't know and didn't watch last time, an astronomical unit is a real-life unit of measurement used to measure the distance between objects in the solar system. It's equivalent to about 93 million miles or the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, and it can easily be used for exoplanets like in the system. The fourth planet in this system orbits the star Alpha Centauri A at 3.1 AU, and it is a small ice giant. In addition to our real-life knowledge, I added several additional bodies to the system that would be scientifically plausible, if not likely to exist, as there is a limit to how much we can see in real life. There are two moons about half the size of our own orbiting the third planet from Proxima Centauri, and four large moons orbiting the ice giant around Alpha Centauri A. This is our Alpha Centauri system, and today we're going to explore the many vast horizons that can be found here in this impressive and historically important star system. We'll be starting off with the planets around Proxima Centauri, and then working our way further and further away from our sun to the planet around Alpha Centauri. Making our way from Proxima Centauri, we come to the first planet, Icarus. The planet that Icarus is based on is known to be 0.02 AU from its parent star, which is super close. It only has a nine day orbit around Proxima Centauri. It's predicted that uh, this planet may be something called an eyeball world, named after how part of its tidally locked surface would be constantly facing its very close parent star while the other faces away, causing one side to glow with a fiery light and the other to be drenched in a cold darkness, looking like an eye of fire, almost like the eye of Sauron. Two things are probably true about the planets closely orbiting Proxima Centauri, uh, and that is that their days are probably extremely slow if they're not tidally locked altogether, uh, judging based on their sizes and distances from their star, and most of them probably have no atmosphere, since the Sun, back in the solar system, had blown the atmosphere off of Mercury and almost entirely off of Mars. Proxima Centauri, a star that 
lets off far higher levels of radiation than our sun does would have definitely completely erased any atmosphere that may have existed on these planets. Well, that is if they don't have an active magnetosphere to keep an atmosphere strong. Icarus does not. It has a dead core, which means there is absolutely no atmosphere here, since there is no air to keep a consistent temperature like on Earth. While the star side melts away into oceans of lava, the far side is a land of ice in this world of extremes. The art here depicts what landing on the night side might look like, with the nearby planet Destel in the distance. And on its surface, towering pillars of ice called Penitente form. This is based on a phenomenon found on the icy moons of our own solar system, like Europa, where vast fields of uh, its surface would be covered in these ice spires. Uh, these are formed when water trapped in the planet's surface siphon out through the cracks in the ground, causing them to freeze instantly into these icy pillars. Icarus, aka Proxima Centauri 1. This scorched super-Earth is a world of extremes. The first ever discovered eyeball planet, its tidally locked surface and distance from its star give its day and night sides vastly different climates. The day side is a world of scorched fire with rivers and oceans of molten iron, while the night side is covered in meter-high penitente, sharp pillars of ice that form when water escapes and freezes above its tortured surface. How water got onto this hellish world in the first place is unknown, however it is theorized that the planet originally formed further out away from its star. Distel is another one of those close dead worlds, however this planet has a rotation allowing for its surface to cool off during the long nights after a day that is equivalent of 98 Earth days. This would be, uh, this planet would be dead and gray and otherwise boring um, were it not for my additions here. The surface would be dotted in phosphorescent rocks that would glow in the dark shortly after sunset. Though it's probably not possible that these would form in such abundance on a surface of a planet like these, these rocks do exist. Uh, they're wicked cool. I saw some on my trip to Toronto around a month ago while I was coming up with ideas for the system and I thought about incorporating them here. Distel, aka Proxima Centauri 2. This dead planet, like Icarus, has no magnetosphere to protect its surface from its star's radiation. Therefore, what atmosphere it may have had in the past was blown away many millions of years ago. Its radiated rocky surface is mostly a dull wasteland, however, there are pockets of phosphorescent rock on its surface that glow in the dark just after dusk. Now we come to the most important planet in the system, the only really inhabited one here, Proxy. The only thing we know about this predicted planet in real life that is that it is a larger than Earth planet at about 1.5 AU uh, from its relatively dim star, meaning that this planet's surface probably resembles Antarctica. Uh, it's probably not likely that this planet would have an atmosphere at all like Earth's, but for story reasons, um, an atmosphere was kind of needed. It's not impossible, however, as nitrogen is a common element out in the universe and oxygen is found on icy moons in our own solar system, as it forms deep in icy crusts, so it's unlikely but not implausible at all. A strong magnetosphere would help this planet keep its Earth-like atmosphere, and that would also have the cool side effect of causing wicked bright aurora across its surface. This planet's history is a long one. It starts back on Earth during the golden days of the solar system. During a time post-Martian war and of political peace, science was advancing at an unprecedented rate. The recent invention of the near light speed engine, the NLS engine, and its even more recent updates could now allow travel at a significant fraction of the speed of light. 
This of course prompted the idea of sending a mission to Alpha Centauri. It was discovered that the third planet orbiting Proxima Centauri had a relatively Earth-like atmosphere, and therefore was a prime candidate for the first extrasolar mission. The mission was launched at the end of the 2400s, with just over half a million people aboard. It landed 20 years later on the surface of Proxima Centauri 3. The planet was a lot less habitable than originally promised. Its breathable atmosphere was thinner than Earth's and of a lower concentration of oxygen, so it was like standing at, the, at a high altitude back home, not to mention the freezing cold blizzards that would often sweep across its surface and the week-long day and night cycle that disoriented its inhabitants, to say the least. The other planets of the system didn't fare much better, however. The people of Proxima Centauri III would come to uh, call this planet Proxy, uh, and they stayed indoors as much as possible. Since Proxy is so far away from Earth, any message would take four years to send back home, and would Earth respond a further four years to get out to the people of Proxima Centauri? So, Eight years after landing and opening communications home, the people of Proxy learned their first news of home. The UNE, a precursor to the USSE, the United Nations of Earth, the people of Proxy's home nation, uh, was at war with Russia in a vicious world war. Proxy, meanwhile, had its own problems, being isolated in a hazardous environment that they didn't feel that they had entirely planned for, they asked the UNE for aid to send people and supplies so that they could keep their citizens alive and healthy. Eight years after that, they got word back from Earth. The UNE would not send people or supplies. Too many resources were going into the war for them to justify sending any missions. The people of Proxy asked again, and a further eight years passed, now nearly a quarter of a century since landing, the state of the proxy colony was an absolute poverty. They were denied aid yet again. A council was held in New Alexandria, the city that would one day become the capital city of the planet. If Earth wouldn't help, then they'd cut off contact. Another message later, now uh, an entire 28 years later, it landed on Earth, and the final transmission to Proxy saw their system go silent. Meanwhile, back on Proxy, the people of the planet uh, went about creating a new home for themselves with what resources that they had. It was, their scientists discovered that Proxy may have formed closer in by the star and therefore had a mineral-rich Earth-like soil miles below its icy crust. It was brought up to the cities and great central park-sized greenhouses were built indoors to feed their people. Missions were sent to the dangerous nearby gas giant Regal to mine what little hydrogen there was to fuel their spaceships. 100 years from when contact was cut, a small scout group from the paramilitary security force organized in New Alexandria was making a patrol of the outer reaches of the system when something baffling was discovered. At first, they thought that this might be first contact with an alien race. The people of Proxy soon discovered that this small group on the outskirts of the system were Earth humans, and that they had technologically exploded after World War III, and now they were building a stargate to travel between the two star systems within mere minutes. Consensus was divisive in New Alexandria, to say the least, as a group of Proxinians saw, that, saw this as an act of invasion. As the gate finished building a month later, a war began. Reminiscent of the Martian War for Independence, the Centurion Wars was a 15-year-long conflict between the vastly outnumbered and outgunned Proxinians and the technologically superior NUNE, the new United Nations of Earth. The war ended more peacefully than the Martian War did, however, as a group of loyalists on proxy began fighting their own front against the PROA, the People's Republic of Alpha Centauri, and soon the weakening of the PROA led to peace talks that led to a reunification with the NUNE's 
full financial support of the Alpha Centauri system with the Solon Peace Accords. It was then where new jump gates were built in the Solar and Alpha Centauri systems to other star systems, and humanity rocketed outward into the cosmos. The planet Proxy, so rich was its history and sitting right on the eastern trade route, became well known for both its transportation industry and its famous high-end colleges that many people spent large sums of money to send their children off-world to. Like the University of New Alexandria, Solon Technical Institute, and Istan College for the Arts, to name a few. Proxy, aka Proxima Centauri III. Proxima Centauri III, aka Proxy, is a very historically important planet. The first exoplanet to have been colonized by humanity, its inhabitants were left isolated from the rest of humanity for over a hundred years before the construction of the first Stargate. Its strong magnetosphere lets it hold on to its frigid Earth-like atmosphere against the solar flares of its parent star. Some of the brightest auroras in the USSE occur on this planet during a solar storm. Its slow day-night cycle plunges its inhabitants into a freezing night for long periods of time, and the negligible temperature shift from day-night uh, causes strong snowstorms. In the modern day, its waning population is kept aloft by a strong economy and rich culture centered around the prestigious and historically significant universities in its capital, New Alexandria. Switching to the stars of the Alpha Centauri pair, Regal is another taste of a themed planetary system of moons. Regal and its four moons um, all share the same theme of deadly yet beautiful from afar. Regal is a small ice gas giant not far from its star. Uh, it has far less hydrogen than is usually found in uh, an ice giant like these. The high concentration of water clouds give this planet a beautiful white sheen from afar, and if flown through its skies, it appears to be much like the skies of Earth. However, these water clouds cause wicked thunderstorms, the arcs of lightning that can strike in bolts of 20 miles or more, dwarfing the ones that can be found on Earth. These lightning strikes can be seen from the nearby space transit station, and are an unpredictable weather phenomenon on the planet. This of course made it very hard to mine during Proxy's isolation from Earth, and no permanent mining rig was ever built. It is not mined today and rarely ever visited due to the relative danger on the planet. Regal's name comes from two things, both its beautiful regal appearance and also the common but largely unused name for its parent star Alpha Centauri, Regeli Centaurus. Regal, aka Alpha Centauri AB1. Regal, like its four major moons, is a beautiful and bright planet from afar. Its upper atmosphere has a large concentration of swirling water clouds. This causes massive lightning storms that can be seen from space. For a period of 100 years before the building of the first FTL gate between the solar system and the Alpha Centauri system, this planet was mined for its sparse hydrogen. However, the atmosphere was so dangerous a permanent rig was never built, and the industries mining the planet moved almost immediately when other systems had been reached. Regal's closest moon, Kuro, is a large moon. It is so close to its parent planet that the gravitational forces stretch and bend its surface causing tidal heating and a cracked crust. Through this crust, sulfuric gas and methane blow out from under the ground, and from these towering chimney stacks, the sulfur and methane cause greenhouse heating that keeps the scorched surface of this moon a hellish one. Its name, Kuro, came from a shortening of corrosive um, as its clouds constantly pour down in acid rain.
Kuro, Moon of Regal. Kuro gets its name from the corrosive yellow clouds in its thick atmosphere. These clouds are formed from sulfuric gas that billows out of the moon's naturally occurring smokestacks. These pillars can range from mere feet tall to almost a kilometer tall and are found all across its scorched surface. This moon has been deemed an NLZ on the account of the intense heat and acidic rain that can break down starship hulls. The second moon, Nola, is the smallest moon of the four, and two orbits very close, close enough to experience tidal heating. The atmosphereless world has a surface of black basalt, through which eruptions of magma flow in rivers that are constantly changing its surface. This moon was the first ever no landing zone after the son of a prominent politician died there. No landing zones, if you remember, are a catalog of dangerous planets kept by the USSE. Nobody will stop you from landing on these planets if you really want to, but no one's gonna help you if you get stuck. The name, NOLA, comes from the first few letters of No Landing Zone. NOLA, Moon of Regal. This moon is named after the fact that it was the first ever officially designated NLZ by the USSE, on account of the volcanic geysers that can often be found shooting up molten rock into space. These are highly likely to strike any ship that flies too low near the surface. The third moon, Esmer, looks beautiful and green from afar. This is because its surface is rich in the stone known as malachite. The winds on the moon polish these stones into shiny green pillars of swirling beauty. This moon's nitrogen-rich atmosphere made it a prime target for colonization when the People's Republic of Alpha Centauri was formed. However, when a base had begun construction, it was soon abandoned as the people found out that a buildup of toxic dusts from the malachite rock would cause going in and out of the habitat to be far too hazardous for people to regularly do. Tracking this dust into the habitat, most people who inhabited the base in a year and a half that it was operational got extremely sick from copper oxide poisoning and many died soon after. Its name, Esmer, comes from the shortening of the Portuguese word for emerald. Esmer, a moon of Regal. Esmer receives its name from a shortening of the Portuguese word for emerald, as from afar streaks of green appear to snake across its surface. It is, this is caused by uh, the high levels of malachite rock found on its crust. The relatively inactive surface was once thought to be a good candidate for light colonization, until explorers discovered that highly toxic dust is constantly off-gassing from the planet's many caves and ravines. Esmer Base, the original landing site, was shortly abandoned, and it was the only moon of Regal that has not been deemed an NLZ. However, exploration of this body is not recommended. The final moon is the Large Moon Mare. It was another moon that was a possible target for colonization at first, as its light and dark patched surface appeared to be a land of lakes from afar. However, this snowy world is like proxy in many ways, except one. Volcanoes rise above its surface of snow and ice, and they erupt in these massive rivers that carve melted canals through the ice and snow constantly causing temperature shifts that cause clouds to form and snow to pelt back down onto its surface, making the ground an impermanent mess. Mare's name came from the word mare that means lake, as this planet was mistaken for being a land of lakes, and it had in the past been wrongly referred to as a warm titan, referring to Saturn's moon. 
It is thought that this moon may have formed out of Regal's planetary system and taken in gravitationally from afar as geological tells allude to the fact that uh, it probably formed around 1 AU and drifted out into Regal's orbit. Mare, a moon of Regal. Mare was once hypothesized to be habitable as there are low amounts of oxygen in its atmosphere. It is a blanket of streaking clouds and a constantly changing surface of dark and light shapes. Those were once mistaken to be bodies of water on its surface. This is where it got its name, Mare, which means lake. It is now known that this moon's arctic surface is constantly buckling and shifting as magma erupts from under its crust, searing away ice and snow that create the clouds in its atmosphere that rain back down as snow or hail. It is a world of extremes and a designated NLZ. So welcome to the Alpha Centauri system. I hope you enjoyed our tour of this less than inhabitable star system today. We will be exploring new star systems like this soon, but not before we create a video conceptualizing the aesthetics of a future civilization of humanity uh, and a timeline video to further put into context the history of these early star systems. If you have any ideas for the series, any sci-fi storylines uh, or prompts that you might like to see for a planet or a spaceship or an alien race, then please leave them in the comments below. This is a super high chance that I could probably incorporate your ideas. If you remember, in the first episode I explained that I've had this idea for History of the Future, a historically rich sci-fi universe for a long time. And I wanted to make these videos of me fleshing out my ideas and bringing this universe to life with you all along the ride with me. Um, someone last time said that I should make a little booklet of these planets, uh, cataloged in a way that might make them easy to translate into like an RPG setting, like D&D. &D. Uh, although I don't have nearly enough to make a book yet, let me know if you might be interested in something like that uh, in the future. If you want to see the art featured in this video in high quality downloadable forms, you can find them in a gallery on my DeviantArt page, linked here and in the description below. And as always, if you like this video and want to see more like it, then subscribe and turn on the bell to get notified when I upload next.